Nigga pre, everybody in the house smoke tree. I'm Viet Cong, do I rook Chinese? So right from the start, you can see this fascination with all things Oriental. I have a new song that I just recorded a couple days ago that's, that'll be out. This is an exclusive, Thanks. exclusive. So I wrote the, um, I had the idea for a song about the earth being flat. I think this was like eight, like seven or eight or nine months ago, I had this idea. And I started writing it, and then I said, all right, this isn't that good. And then I put it away, came back to it a month later, wrote a bit more, then said, ah, oh, this isn't that good. You know, over and over, finally, like a month ago, I finally just looked at it with a fresh set of eyes and said, oh, this is going to be great. So I, I, I finished writing it and then, you know, just recorded it and been working on the video. It's like it makes me laugh, you know, even though I'm the one who wrote it. <laughs> like watching, watching this video that I'm working on, I'm like, this is good stuff, so... I mean, it, it can sometimes take weeks or, or, or months or years, maybe decades. Maybe, I'll ha maybe, I'll, maybe there'll be a project that'll only emerge after a full lifetime. <laughs> then you die, you find some little notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, Someone comes and records. I'll leave a note behind. Since we talked about such a serious subject, uh, you have uh, attempt suicide and... Uh, you know, and this is a little touchy you know, of talking about as a problem that a lot of people face. I think pretty much everybody will face this situation. They well, might. I mean, I think there's such a big topic of just uh, how to approach this because oh. psychologists in, you know, psychologists, which is a it's, a it's a field that emerged in the 20th century and it's in the form that we recognize it, came at a time when uh, when scientists don't recognize that people are conscious, they don't take consciousness seriously. So if you, if I try telling somebody, oh, the, the reason you're depressed is because you've been collecting these ideas your whole life, like, uh, like ideas of what's moral and what's true and how you should behave and what you should, uh, what you should think is true. And you've got all these contradictions and it's driving you crazy and you have no purpose, you have no direction. He'll just say, oh, no, that's not scientific. That's just philosophy. But, you know, depression, quote unquote, that's a medical condition. That's mental health, as they call it. So there's a lot, a lot to say about that. But I mean, you asked about me and my experience. Uh, so I was very uncomfortable uh, in, as a teenager. I was very angry, um, very unhappy, very the, kind of the more I learned about the world and people, the more I was disappointed and and I was frustrated and I was smoking weed and I kind of kept wanting to stop, but I couldn't. And it became like all I cared about and other drugs. It, it turned into I discovered amphetamines that became my new favorite thing. And of course, that uh, loses its edge if you do it regularly. So as I was going through all of this, I um, I also had big dreams. I wanted to live a good life, and um, but I, I was living with contradictions, and I was feeling very uncomfortable in my own skin and in my own skull. So as a teenager, I used to look up. I don't know if there was Google yet. I don't know if Google was popular. I don't remember, but maybe it was on Yahoo. I would search, like, ways to, c to commit suicide, and... I never actually attempted it until I was 19 when um, I don't remember exactly what kind of what drove me to it. I just remember feeling very uncomfortable and it was a mixture of like an internal feeling and also externally seeing that I had no future thinking like, like there's just nothing to look forward to. Um, so the method that I tried was to take uh, the remaining pills in a bottle of Excedrin PM, which is a very weak uh, sleeping aid, pain reliever. So somebody might say, if I really wanted to die, I would have found a more sure way to go. And maybe this was maybe subconsciously me kind of attempting it without really, really giving it my best shot. But I did, I did swallow maybe like 60% of a bottle of Excedrin PM. And then got into bed and wrote a note that I don't remember what I wrote and then uh, fell asleep. And I woke up the following. I woke up around 4 a.m. in a lot with a credible nausea and pain. I crawled to the bathroom and vomited painfully, very painfully. Um, but also, like, as this was happening, realizing, OK, I'm still alive. Looks like I'm uh, looks like I'm not going anywhere for now. Um, and, you know, I, 
things got much better over the the, the preceding years. Obviously, I, I grew. I, I made some uh, my my career as as we know it came about just a sh- couple short years after that because I because I worked at it because I decided to uh, keep trying at it. Um, and you know, uh, philosophically, I kind of found my way. I quit smoking weed and I quit drinking, and I really uh, took that seriously because I saw that as an important part of everything else, career as well as happiness. And finally, in 2016, in uh, around uh, like around this time, a little a little after. No, I mean, we're having this conversation in July, so around I think September of 2016, I wrote a parody of that. The song "Closer" by Chainsmokers, and I and it's about suicide, and it's kind of, it's 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 morbid, but it's also kind of a joke. Like it's sort of both. It it walks that fine line, and then in the, uh, I decided in that in the closing, like in the end of the video, I'll I'll write a written message, uh, saying, you know, this is I don't remember exactly what it said, but uh, ten yeah. years after my failed suicide attempt, I want to give a message of hope. If I had died in the summer of 2006, then Rukka Rukka Ali would have never been born. And a lot of people, of course, commented and contacted me saying how much that meant to them and how much my jokes and comedy has helped them. But and that's that's really nice. Uh, but, you know, that shouldn't be what keeps anybody going. I mean, comedy is great and entertainment is a vital part of life, as is, as is art. But I mean, the battle is bigger than that. The battle is really about every individual saying, like, what do I want? Do I believe it's possible to be happy? Do I believe success is possible? What does success mean to me? And am I willing to am I willing to work for it? Because uh, most people are addicted in some respect, either to a substance or to a pattern of behavior that is very complacent. So if you're if you're as an individual, if you're willing to uh, uh, put yourself through some discomfort on on your way to getting what you want. I think, I think good times are ahead. And since that time, I've also begun talking about philosophy, and I've begun talking about sobriety. And um, I I've also gotten more people contact me since then, saying you know thanking me for that. And, and that's that, of course, is really nice. Um, it, you know, assu- assuming that's you know, why you co- yeah. you keep yourself that open and accessible to your audience you like this feedback I mean, having a conversation is always interesting to me and uh yeah i you know like but like i mean when people do tell me like oh this this something that i did has helped them you, i need to take it with a grain of salt because i don't know this person so they could just be saying it for attention that's i mean that's something i would have done when i was young if i if i met you know my favorite artist or anybody who I considered famous, I might start telling them, oh, you've influenced my life so much. I might have exaggerated a bit because you're yeah. looking for something to bond with this person over and you're you're excited and all of that. So, yeah, um, I don't I don't you know, I don't take the, uh, the I don't take the hatred. I try not to take the hatred from people, but also even some of the really nice things people say. If I don't really know anything about them, I, I sometimes don't really take it that seriously either because I don't know. But it is great. Yeah, it is great. It, you know, That's nice. yeah. the first song that opened the career of a parody maker 10 years ago and more than a million subscribers is I can do whatever I'm white. That's and it. Uh, I guess because of that, you probably been accused of being racist for. A, yeah, that for a good song. Amount of people. So how much love and hate you take from the same art you produced how, how is that um you know so i can do whatever i'm white was pretty tame compared to what i've done since then so at the time i got a lot of comments and messages back then you could message people on youtube and i remember someone messaging me saying like fuck you you think you can do whatever you want because you're white so yeah <laughs> People were offended, but then, um, but other people interpreted it differently. They were saying, oh no, this is a social statement. He's saying that there's white privilege. So oh. there, it's always, there's always so, pe- people who like it will, will take what they want from it often I've seen. And people that are triggered by it will interpret it. I mean, people, a lot of people who also like, they were upset by it because they thought that I'm criticizing white people in a, in an inappropriate 
the arguments that you put in that song, like where did those things come from? Well, I was the only white privilege, I think, was running red lights. Other than that, I talked about getting away with things that only white people do, like wearing at the time I said wearing shorts above your knees, like short shorts. Today, <laughs> today, nobody wears. Like, uh, yeah, <laughs> today it, 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 it's flipped. So in, in the sequel to that song, in the a- anniversary edition that I released a few months ago, yeah. um, I said I can wear what, what was it? Something about low shorts.